Uh, our next speaker uh, is the third co-founder of Zaytuna College. Uh, Sheikh Hamza Youssef is an American convert to Islam who studied for several years under leading scholars in the Muslim world. He is the co-founder of Zaytuna College in California and has translated into modern English several classical Arabic texts and poems. He also advises Stanford University's program in Islamic studies and the Center of Islamic Studies at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. Would you please welcome Sheikh Hamza Youssef. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslima kathira. Wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billah al-Ali al-Azim. Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to God alone. The, 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 this tash that was made has a symbol on it. Of, um, this is a symbol that's found all over the Muslim world. You'll find it, in fact, in Morocco, you find it over the doors of the Moroccan houses. You find it in mosques in India, in Syria. And it, it's, it's a symbol of the Prophet's sandal. And it's a sandal, actually, that's honored in the Topkopi uh, palace in Istanbul, the sandal is actually there, and this is the form of the sandal. And the Muslims uh, have always honored the sandal of the Prophet. And it's said that his two sandals were the sandals of fear and hope. And these are the two sandals that are necessary to walk the path of life, to have the, the sandal of fear and the sandal of hope. It's, it's basically paradise in the inferno. And so we set out on this path with fear and with hope. We set out on this path with fear that our intentions might not be up to the standard that they need to be. I know that Fatima Fihriya, when she founded the Qarawiyin University, which is our teacher Ustad Abdullah, is a graduate of the Qarawiyin. When she actually donated the land to build the university there, which is the oldest university in the world probably, in the true sense of that, that word. She fasted the entire time that the place was being built in hopes that it would be accepted from God as a place of learning. And we find many, many stories of the early people, the type of sincerity and devotion that they displayed in doing these things so we, we are trusting, and I don't want to make a claim, because the Qur'an says, وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَدْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ Whoever truly trusts in God, God will suffice. But I come from a tradition that warns us of making claims. And that's where the hope comes in. We hope that we're truly trusting in God. To make the claim of, I am indeed trusting in God, like the men who arrived in the pilgrimage from Yemen, and they had no provision with them. And the Quran tells people to take provision on your journey. And when Sayyidina Omar saw them, he said, who are you? And they said, we're the mutawakilun. We're the people that trust in God. He said, no, you're the mutaakilun. You're the people that need to beg for food. <laughs> and then he said to Zawadu, take provision. And then the Quran reminds us, but the best provision is the provision of piety. A word, unfortunately, that has been almost removed from the English language. It's, it's become almost a, a, a historical anomaly, this idea of piety. And I remember uh, my dear sister, and I think it's auspicious that, and, and, and I don't say this lightly, I think it's auspicious that a direct descendant of Patrick Henry is here with us in this convocation because he really started the American Revolution and this is part of the American Revolution. What's happening here today is part of the American Revolution because America began as a place that wanted to depart from the ways of the old world. And the ways of the old world was fighting each other over religious doctrine. This was a place that they wanted to see people actually able to express their faith. 
And Patrick Henry was amongst those, and there was an early debate that wanted to see Christianity as the religion of America, and he was a profoundly devout Christian. And he actually argued for having religious tests. There were a group of founding fathers, and they're quoted constantly by a certain segment of an extreme religious right in this country, arguing that America is a Christian nation. But there was another group of founding fathers that actually argued against that, and they were the ones that won the day. And in some ways, we're back in that struggle again of defining what America is. And there are some people that want to retain a, uh, a vision of America that perhaps never was. My own, and we were talking about uh, the Catholics earlier, and I completely agree with Dr. Donahue that we have an immense amount of knowledge in previous religious experiences, and the Catholic religious experience in this country is one of the richest, as well as the Jewish religious experience in this country, for Muslims to benefit from. But my own family, who were uh, on my father's side, were Catholic, Irish Catholic immigrants to this country, and they built churches. They built, my great grandfather was a patron of St. Joseph's Catholic College in Philadelphia, and my grandfather graduated from that college. On my mother's side, we have my great grandfather, Peter Yorgiopoulos, who changed, they changed the name to George, built the first Orthodox church in San Francisco at the turn of the, uh, of the t 20th century. So I come from a family that has a rich tradition of expressing religious faith in an environment that was antagonistic to that faith because the Orthodox faith a hundred years ago was not really an acceptable form of Christianity to many, many people in this country. And the Irish Catholics probably suffered as much as any minority that's come to the, the, the shores with the possible exception of the African American community. But the Irish American community suffered greatly for their faith and for their beliefs. So this country is, is about liberty and what was articulated in starting this revelation, uh, revolution was give me liberty or give me death. That liberty was more precious to that man who, who, who made that statement. And, and the greatest freedom is the freedom of conscience. The ability to actually say what you think, to be able to believe uh, something and to articulate that belief and not be ashamed of it, not, to, not have to hide that. We have Muslims in the United States of America right now that are hiding their faith that have changed their names, that use other names. This is what my great-grandfather, who dropped the O from Hansen, my grandfather's name was Hansen, but his grandfather's name was O. Hansen. And they hid their Irish roots because it was very difficult to be Irish in this country in a certain strata of American society. My Greek grandfather changed his name from Yorgiopoulos to George and hid his Greek roots. He was a light-skinned Greek. And he was able to be somebody who said he was actually from France until the 60s enabled him to reassert his Greek heritage. And then he actually participated in building the Greek church now in San Anselmo in, in Marin County. He was the president of that church. But it, it took an evolution in American consciousness for him to feel comfortable enough to assert the fact that he was a Greek Orthodox immigrant to the United States of America. We would have thought that we have transcended this problem, that we're, we've arrived. Obama, Barack Hussein Obama, is President of the United States. We were at the inauguration at, in the church setting, and we had a woman in a hijab who actually was part of the ceremony, and Barack Obama's grandmother, a Luo tribeswoman from Kenya, was sitting in the front pew wearing a traditional Kenyan Muslim hijab. And I'm thinking, subhanAllah, you know, glory to God, mashallah. But ground zero has erupted this debate. And this country is really, I think, struggling again about who it is and what it is, who we are as a people. We're in a time of incredible confusion for many, many people. Our young people, when we look out, I mean, just coming to this convocation and, and we wanted something dignified, 
And I said the, my only criterion was it wasn't pretentious. But I wanted something dignified because religion is about dignity. It's about the dignity of human beings. We are not animals. We are the meeting place between the terrestrial and the celestial. We're something exalted. We're something extraordinary. We have language. We produce language. We write poetry. We have feelings that other creatures do not share with us. We have the concept of infinity. And yet outside in one of the greatest universities in the United States of America, we have uh, frat houses and people coming, just walking up the street, the, 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 the sights that we see. For me, it saddens me. I don't know how anybody could be happy about seeing young people with such a loss of dignity for me. I see this as a loss of dignity and I see it really, it's becoming a global phenomenon. The t-shirt and the shorts have become the global uniform of globalization. And it wasn't that long ago when just dress and the dignity of dress, if you look in traditional societies everywhere, People had such dignity in the way they dressed. Even the poorest of people dressed with such dignity. Aboriginal peoples. The native, some Native American tribes used to call off uh, conflicts if it rained because they didn't want the feathers to get dampened. That it was more important to be dignified in the battle than to actually fight the battle. great American poet that I like began a song. Blind, uh, w wise man looking in a blade of grass, young man looking at the shadows that pass, poor man looking through painted glass for dignity. Dignity. That really is what education is about. It's what not just higher learning, but from the primary school, treating children with dignity. We know what harm now is caused by humiliating children. Imam al-Ghazali, the great articulator of, of Islam, said never scold a child in front of other children, but always take it aside. Because he said when you shame a child in front of children, you create humiliation in their hearts. And he said those children will lose the sense of shame. And they will actually get worse and worse. We have an immense task ahead of us. Zaytuna College is an attempt. Its success is going to be entirely determined by the support of the community. There's immense support in our community so far. It's nowhere near what we need. But we're, we're, we're looking forward to it. And... Insha'Allah, trusting in God to the best of our ability. I want to thank many, many people who have come here. Uh, I, want, I want to thank, I saw uh, Rabbi Lerner, Michael Lerner, uh, come in, and I'm, I'm so glad to see him well and healthy. <laughs> Rabbi Lerner was in my personal prayers when he was, um, when, when I found out that he was sick, so it's, it's really an honor to have him here with us and many other people. I really, I think, uh, Dr. Donahue, I, I really feel like what he articulated, and you are a tough audience because I would have given him a standing ovation, hands down, but it was just such an incredible... It was such an incredible articulation on many different levels and I, so much went into it and I was just honored by the fact that he took so much time uh, to, to put that thought into it and, and, and I want to study it and I really hope the other uh, faculty members and the students look at it and really think about what he was saying because this is a man who's coming with an immense amount of experience in the very things that we're going to be grappling with. And GTU, the Graduate Theological Union, has, in some ways, the seed was planted by Sister Marianne Farina many, many years ago. She's here today. <laughs> she is a devout Catholic nun who's also a lover of Imam al-Ghazali and actually wrote her dissertation 
uh, looking at Imam al-Ghazali and St. Thomas Aquinas. And she came to me over 10 years ago, and we had a meeting in a yurt. And there are meetings in life that you don't forget, and then there's meetings that uh, you forget, and then there's meetings you wish you could forget. But that, <laughs> that was a meeting that I, I could not forget because she, she really planted a seed. She said, at the Graduate Theological Union, we have, we have all of these religions on the top of this hill teaching their traditions. And she says, you're one-fourth of the world's population. Where are the Muslim colleges? Where's the Muslim seminary to teach Muslims? You need to do it. Zaytuna should think about that. And that was really a, a, a turning point that came from Sister Marianne. And uh, I, I really thank you and honor you for coming today in support uh, of, of what we're trying to do. And now this, this, this is a courageous group of young people. Um, they really are because... Uh, religion is about faith and, and their presence here really is an act of faith because they're coming into something that is new. We're all starting new. And, and also some of the parents, not all of them needed their parents' permission, but some of the parents that allowed their students, I mean, we had some students that could have easily gone to Ivy League colleges, and, and they chose to come here and support this endeavor. It's, it's, a, it's a historical group of young people, and, and we thank them for honoring us in, in putting, placing their trust uh, in, in their Lord, but also... Uh, we would say, and then in us. So we, we really honor that. Many, many other people I see here uh, that I want to thank for, for coming and supporting us. We've had immense support in the Muslim community. Zaytuna is known now all over the world. And when I, when I was at the Azhar University, which is one of the oldest universities, they have over 300,000 students at Al-Azhar, which just floored me. I had no idea they had that many students. But it's one of the oldest universities in the Muslim world. And the Azharis, the, the ones that begin from that early period and go through, go through an incredibly rigorous training, and they're actually quite stunning as scholars. They really are. Al-Azhar has fallen on hard times. They're really trying to reinvigorate it, but they want a relationship with us. The, I was also in Morocco. I, I just was um, a guest at the King's Lectures there in the Durus al the, the minister there of religious endowments also said that we are behind you and the Qarawiyin University, which is a great Islamic university, is also uh, looking to establish ties with us. I mean, this is incredible. It's just a blessing. And in light of that, I just want to remind myself and all of you, we've ha heard a lot of poetry, but you're going to hear one more poem. And, and it's important because poetry, to me, religion without poetry is, is, is like uh, the nuclear uh, waste. It, it becomes toxic if you don't have religion with poetry. All of the companions of the prophet, uh, the, the great ones that we know of, were poets. I have a book called uh, Shi'r al-Sahaba, the poetry of the companions of the Prophet. They all wrote poetry. The Prophet loved poetry. Once he was riding on a camel with a, a companion, and he said, do you know any of the poetry of Ibn Abi Salt? He was a pre-Islamic poet. And he said, yes. And the, and the Sahabi said, I was ashamed to recite something. So I just recited two lines. And the Prophet said, Ihi, let's hear some more. And he said, so I recited two more. And then he said, Ihi, let's hear some more. And he said, I kept going until I recited over 100 verses. In another narration, Sayyidina Omar asked somebody if they knew the poetry of, uh, of Ibn Abi Sulma, one of the great poets of the Jahili period. And one of them, Ibn Abbas, said, yes. And he said, let's hear it. And he kept reciting it until they heard the Adhan of Fajr. And then he said, let's hear some Quran. <laughs> so... The, the, the prerequisite of learning uh, Quranic tafsir or exegesis is, is to master the Jahali poetry. It's a prerequisite. And some of it is quite ribald. It shocked me when I was studying. In fact, there's a whole slew of erotic poetry in the Arabic tradition that is very shocking to a young convert studying Arabic. In, in, and, I, and I wasn't married at the time, so reading this poetry was actually quite, um, quite racy, really. But... They were certainly not prudes, that, that early 
uh, community, and when religion becomes prudish, it also becomes dangerous. It really does. And, and so we, we really want to see a, a, a beautiful type of Islam emerge in America, and, and it will, and it is. The, the prophet once asked, some people were going to a wedding, and he said, is there any entertainment? And they said, no. He said, find some entertainment, because I want Jews and Christians to see we've got room in our religion, you know, that we're not uptight, that it's not an uptight faith. And, and that was important for him, of how his religion was perceived by others. That is not an insignificant hadith that the Prophet was concerned with how people saw the religion. There are unfortunately some Muslims that could care less how other people view their faith. But I care very deeply about how other people view my faith because it's a beautiful faith and whether they embrace it or not, I would like to at least, I would like to see people recognizing the beauty of the Islamic tradition, of its architecture, of its clothing, of its calligraphy, of its food, of its music, of all the various expressions, and of its devotion, of its simplicity. All of those things that make Islam the stunning faith that it is and that's nourished me for the last 32 years of my life. But this poem is a poem by one of my favorite poets, Robert Frost, and it's called The Fear of God. And I say this really to, as a reminder to us at Zaytuna at what we're embarking on. Robert Frost writes, if you should go from somewhere, from nowhere to, up to somewhere, from being no one up to being someone, be sure to repeat to yourself you owe it to an arbitrary God whose mercy to you rather than to others won't bear too critical examination. Stay unassuming. If for lack of license to wear the uniform of who you are, you should be tempted to make up for it in a subordinating look or tone, beware of coming too much to the surface and using for apparel what was meant to be the curtain of the inmost soul. Humility is the great quality of our prophet. He said, I was commanded to be humble so that no one would show arrogance over any other. He said, be humble for the sake of God, and God will elevate you. I really hope that we set out humbled with the task that is ahead. It's an immense task. And, and I'm humbled by the presence of the people that have come, uh, by Dr. Uh, James and Rabbi Michael Lerner from, from these great faith traditions that went before Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, and by all of you for coming out. Thank you, and, and really thank this uh, extraordinary group of young people. It's a very diverse group, um, and, and I'm really hoping that we can serve them as well as they're expecting us to. May Allah bless all of you. May your Ramadan be blessed. Thank you. Jazakumullah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa